Hey everybody, welcome back to the Look It Out podcast. This is your host, Elias Roush. This podcast is sponsored by EliasRoushMedia.com, photo, video, digital media production. Today we are discussing the first episode of the woman in the house across the street in the window that's reading the book that has so much wine and a lot of cash roll. <laughs> what the hell is this thing called? The woman in the house across the street from the girl in the window. It's a dark comedy thriller mystery. So just to kind of put that out there, it's intentionally kind of ridiculously titled. Not to be confused with the woman in the house or the woman in the window film. Uh, so uh, the woman in the house across the street from the girl in the window is an American dark comedy thriller, streaming television miniseries created by Rachel Ramos, um, Hugh Davidson, and Larry Dorff. Primarily a parody of mystery psychological thriller films, the series stars Kristen Bell, Michael Ely, Tom Riley, Mary Holland, Cameron Britton, and Samsara Yet. The series was released on January 28th, 2022 on Netflix. It's received mixed reviews from uh, critics uh, and probably, you know, regular audience alike. Um, while the performance of Bell's, uh, Bell's performance was praised. So um, the premise of this show is a heart broken woman named Anna is unsure of whether or not she has witnessed a murder. And just like many other murder mysteries, I think this follows intentionally the same footsteps, the same trajectory as a lot of these types of murder mysteries happen. When I was watching the first episode and several episodes in without kind of going to any spoilers at this point, I was thinking that this is much, this is like, what you would consider uh, spicy, spicy Lifetime. So when Lifetime came out with uh, You and uh, other other seasons of uh, television shows like that, that were kind of uh, in that realm of a little bit more higher production valued uh, television shows, that this kind of fits the bill. I feel like I couldn't tell initially if it was supposed to be ridiculous or not, but as you get into the series, you realize that it's uh, it's following tropes you've seen in murder mysteries like this before. So um, let's talk about uh, the technicals real quick. Um, all episodes are directed by Michael Lehman, I believe, or Lehman. Uh, eight episodes approximately 30 minutes each and i gotta say that 30 minute mark is it says 20 to 30 minute episodes there's actually a 20 minute episode in here um that i think it really pushes the pacing in a, in a, a more positive direction i think that if these were episodes that were 40 minutes 50 minutes an hour i'd be sitting here tapping my foot like oh my gosh we got to we got to get this over with because the predictability about it is what's almost so funny and almost so ironic. And actually, I'm actually looking at the executive producers, Rachel Ramos, Hugh Davidson, Larry Dorff, Kirsten Bell. Will Farrell is a producer on here. Jessica Ebaum, Brittany Segal, Michael Lehman, um, all producers, and Danielle Weinstock. Those are executive producers and uh, are produced by... Daniel Weinstock. The cinematography is by John W. Lindley. I gotta say, I, I like the cinematography in this. I'd say the majority of what separates Netflix's spicy Lifetime type television from actual Lifetime television or Hallmark um, would not only be a little bit better writing, but most of it has to do with the cinematography. I think that the cinematography and most of... Uh, Lifetime and Hallmark shows are just so bright and almost look like commercials. This actually kind of leans into the, uh, the darkness a little bit, kind of makes it, like I said, spicy, uh, makes it look interesting and have depth. Um, so 
Production companies, Hugh, Rachel, Larry, uh, and Gloria Sanchez Productions. Um, I think that's Will Ferrell's production company, actually. I'm not 100% sure, though. Um, and was released on January 28th. So uh, let's talk about this first episode real quick. Before we get into spoilers, we're going to talk about this first episode, and then I'm going to talk about the last episode. Um, first episode... Uh, initial watching it, I was like, oh, God, this is starting to feel like a very generic uh, crime thriller. Um, using tropes we've seen before, uh, you know, hallucinations, flashbacks, you know, why is she this way? Why is this happening that way? What's going on? Um, that type of thing. Very much in the same realm of like what Kevin Hart just released of the Kevin Hart just released a show called, uh, it was a mini series, True Story, I believe it was called. And it feels like it kind of goes on that, um, on that same realm of trajectory of crime, uh, storytelling. So I got to say, when I was watching the majority of it, I think I predicted the 90% of what happened in this television show. So the predictability is, is it's right there. I almost wish I could have like a bingo bingo card of like oh this is gonna happen oh that's gonna happen oh that happened i i swear i had three or four times within the series i was like i just called that physically 10 minutes before it happened so uh you know the with the red herrings with uh you know did he really do it did she really do it that type of thing there's a lot of uh a lot of that not generic, but tropey storytelling when it comes down to the show. Now, uh, with the performances, Kristen Bell has, uh, I don't think she's ever been better. I haven't seen her in too much recently. The last thing I really enjoyed seeing her on just as just as kind of a wild character was forgetting Sarah Marshall. And I don't think that her career has really taken off in the same trajectory since that was so much of a comedy that kind of I don't want to say typecaster in a way but I can't really recall too many other of her performances that are evoking her uh, ability to have uh, you know, to, to show crime and drama on screen most of it was her kind of being sassy so so to speak and so to see her to actually act in this um, from all directional standpoints of being able to emote, I think she's a fantastic, fantastic, uh, actress. So, um, before you get into the series, you're going to want to know if you want to watch it. I think that's the ultimate thing is that's, that's why I podcast. I watch it so that you can understand and articulate whether you should watch it or not as well. So I got to say, Watching all eight episodes, the the show is entertaining. It's predictable up until about episode seven or eight, and then what I call hap, what I call uh, jumping the shark happens around episode eight. So the believability completely goes flying out the window. Um, but I was still entertained. It turns almost into a bad movie at the end, like a C grade B grade movie at the end. But not in ways that I felt like I wasted my time. I, I, I do think it's kind of ridiculous, but um, I thought it was in, it was interesting. Um, not exactly compelling for me, and I didn't have like an emotional reaction other than any than like laughing here and there. But uh, yeah, it's kind of of that of that same realm of uh, storytelling with showing the red herrings. It's like was it the neighbor? Was it the uh, the mailman? Was it the you know, the milk truck man. It's like, what you know, you you as the audience are kind of placed in her shoes trying to figure out the crime. And so um, with saying that, hold on to your casseroles, pour yourself the biggest glass of wine, and let's talk about this uh, first episode real quick because uh, I, I can't wait to get the spoilers. I think we're going to do this in two separate segments. So the first episode will be this podcast, and then we will divide it into a second podcast for the second, uh, for the last episode. So episode one, living in Canterbury Hill, Anna prepares chicken casserole, but often breaks the dish. 
she also hears strange voices coming from her roof, uh, making her believe in the existence of monsters. So we got this kind of like uh, supernatural kind of shit going on. Um, she often sleeps on the sofa while drinking um, and taking prescription drugs. She has this big innocuous past behind her of something's happened to her, but you're not exactly sure why she's in this emotional state. So um, Kristen Bell's really bringing her um, a game, I'd say, with this, um, with regards to the kind of the limited script I feel like they kind of give her. They don't give her um, tons to. Let me rewind. I think if we had another actor or actress playing this main character, this could have this could have gone really bad. But I think that Kristen Bell plays it just right of kind of like bubbly, surprised and sympathetic at all at the same time that she's like perfect for this role. So one morning she wakes up and sees through the window a handsome, hunky new neighbor, Neil, taking his daughter, um, Emma, to school. She goes to school herself, believing that she has to drop off her daughter, Elizabeth, before remembering that Elizabeth died three years ago. Um, her neighbor, Carol, has set up a date for Anna, but she stands the man up as she hallucinates that Elizabeth is still alive. Anna visits Elizabeth's grave, taking there about her, sorry, talk, sorry, talking about her new neighbors. Elizabeth's headstone reads, if love could have saved you, you would have lived forever. Emma grows closer to Anna by selling her chocolates. Emma's the neighbor's daughter across the street. Neil finds out Anna has an irrational fear of rain. I'm not sure if it's irrational. She had a pretty traumatizing day. When he takes uh, a fainted Anna to her home. Anna hallucinates that Neil has sex with her. So once again, we have this spicy lifetime. And I haven't mentioned that Neil very much sounds and looks a lot like an English Penn Bagley from uh, the main character of You. So we have, you know, the hunky white guy across the street as young Mick's daughter. Um... And we have Kristen Bell kind of wishing she was part of that family. She kind of is enveloped, engulfed in just uh, not quite obsessive nature yet. But there is this hinge of she wants Neil. She wants to be the mother. She wants that life back. And she's also talking to this unknown therapist as well, who we haven't seen um, at this point. So just hopping off of this first episode, I think they do everything they can to, um, you know, hook you in, hook you into the uh, the, sto the story, um, help you understand the logistics of this lady's mindset, why she's not really OK and uh, emotionally OK. And uh, she's burning her hand on this casserole like none of it, no one's business. Um, so I got to say. This show for this first episode has very light laughs. I don't feel like I was really kind of gut gut wrenching, sorry, gut wrenching, gut busting laughing or anything like that until about the third or fourth episode because I wasn't exactly sure if this show knew that it was being ridiculous um, and ridiculous on purpose. You see the main character pouring a bottle of wine all the way to the fucking top, you know, and, uh, you know, just getting s slammed, uh, the casserole. There's so many run on jokes with these, uh, it's almost run on jokes that are all visual in, in a sense. Um, which I find funny, just small little things like the casserole. Um, and, 
I got to say this, this mailman, this weird male mailman, I was looking at him. I wasn't quite sure if that was who it was, but, uh, the mailman's kind of, he's, he's definitely part of the story. And I, without going into too many details, um, if you're just watching this first episode, how long does this guy take to <laughs> uh, build a damn mailbox? Now, I'm not going to say anything else after that. Um, so, yeah, it's not exactly – it's almost like the prelude for this first episode because I don't really feel like any crime really happens until about the second. Um, so, yeah, that is the first episode of the woman in the house across the street in the window or something like that. <laughs> and without going into detail of the rest of the season, um, it does get ridiculous. It is, in my opinion, entertaining. The production value is there. I do think it was probably shot during um, COVID because multiple times, it's never acknowledged that COVID's there, but it definitely feels like there's kind of limited people in the, the scenes. Um, and the way that she's having to carry the show, Kristen Bell's having to carry the show, she's alone a lot in the show. So uh, with saying that, let's hop into the final episode of the series, episode eight, I believe. And uh, yeah, let me know what you thought about the podcast. Let me know what you thought about this first episode of, I gotta say it right, of the woman in the house across the street from the girl in the window. <laughs> Hashtag, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I'd recommend it if you got four hours. It, it, it's kind of blissfully just dumb in a way that I think is still got high enough production value that it's still entertaining. Uh, but yeah, so check out, check this out. Um, be sure to check out the final episode we are getting ready to record. We're going to release them in two different days. So stay tuned, subscribe, like, you know what to do, comment. Let me know what you thought about the woman in the house across the street from the girl in the window. <laughs> and uh, yeah, take it easy. Luckadawpodcast.com for the entire library of podcasts in the window with a glass of wine and some casserole.